Alright, well, uh, sound is speeding, uh, Gabriel. Timer is flowing. Timer's, timer's on. Timer's sound on. is speeding. We're cooking with gas. I'm just gonna own it. Right, are you, are you locked in now? I'm gonna own the fact I look like shit right now. Pause. I look like shit. It's the that second. is the most. That's like a rock concert, like a, you know, like, a, like in the seventies, like, and then the band comes on, you know. Dude, second week in a row you're saying this. You need to drop it. You need to drop the act. You look great. I don't look. I don't look great. Colin, you look ten out of ten. No, nah, that's. I hope I don't look ten out. If this is my ten out of ten, <laughs> I'm really in tough shape. Um, hopefully people are just listening to this and not watching it. But. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're we're coming in hot this week. Hot, and that's a uh, pun intended, there, isn't it? It is. Are we, this is, in my opinion, we're finding a new way to like tighten up the show, revamp it a little bit, and we want to keep things pretty streamlined for all of you. Big question for Colin: We haven't really discussed. Are we going to keep the clapping? I say let's do away with the clap. What do you think? The clap is dead today. Yeah. All right. So let's do one last clap right now. The and clap then, dies today. This is the funeral for the clap. <laughs> and then the next episode, you're going to start full video audio. Maybe a nice little fade in. Nice. But otherwise. Alright, ready? Ready. All right. And, whoa. Three, two. Oh, my God. Dude, my, my. It's, I know. It's, Guys, if you hear the is buzzing. This the right, is this the right mic? Yeah, what do you mean? Well, you know we have three. I think that's the right one. Yeah. You I think feel like the it, rogue mic? No, I feel like it. <laughs> Let's get you a new one. Let's get you a new one. I'm just curious because this one's all scratched, which means Let's we probably use one. it try more. Try this. Try this. Reload. Reload. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? I maybe it's slightly better. Who fucking knows? <sighs> Listen, what are what what movie are we talking about today? Dude? We're talking about a movie that's filled with lots of explosive sound. So this might be lots of explosive sound. Really, really appropriate. Yeah, we're talking about Oppenheimer. Haunted Mansion. What? <laughs> Aren't we doing our episode on Haunted Mansion today? Was that oh, the best yeah, yeah, yeah. film of the year? We watched Haunted Mansion. It was. Uh, let's just move on. Um, <laughs> and um, all right, one more time. Job. What film are we doing today? Um, we're doing Oppenheimer. Written for the screen mm. by Christopher Nolan, directed by Christopher Nolan. You guys know him from movies such as Inception. Bum, ba, da, the entire Dark Knight trilogy, mm, 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 mm. Interstellar, mm, no. Memento, Prestige. I love the Prestige. Prestige. Yep. Dunkirk. I mean, this guy is just mm-hmm. Chris mm-hmm. Nolan's a uh, barn on one of my favorite filmmakers. Um, probably, probably the um, leading. I'll just say the leading, probably the leading modern filmmaker. I would say, like the leading modern director. Like, if I had to be, like, who's the biggest director in the world, like, who's making, like, truly making, like, modern stuff, I would say Chris Nolan. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like that's obviously, like, ex- I'm excluding, like, my favorite filmmaker Scorsese from that because Scorsese's kind of doing what Scorsese has done for a long time, and he's doing it quite well. But I think Chris Nolan, I would say, has defined sort of... um modern cinema contemporary cinema in the in the biggest way um thoughts uh i don't feel i don't, I don't want to disagree with you because i know what you're getting at i do think chris nolan's still kind of doing what chris nolan always does yeah of course. I, I think the thing for me with nolan is he is like a true artist of cinema yeah um to say that he's the premier filmmaker in the world defining modern cinema doesn't feel quite right for me because I think the majority of people's relationships with movies does not include Christopher Nolan. The majority of people in general. Mm. But for like, you know, filmmakers, for the um, testing the limits of, you know, cinema, absolutely. I think, you, I actually disagree. I think you're understating it, but that's just yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah. I just, I think outside of the, the dun- outside of Dark Knight trilogy and Interstellar, I still don't think a lot of people know who he is. I, I completely disagree. Okay. 
I think, I mean, there's a reason why his movies, all of his movies have gotten marketed a year in advance uh, since Interstellar. Um, it's because his name uh, carries a, a real weight to it. Um, I would say across the world um, for people who uh, love movies specifically. So if people are into movies, they know who Christopher Nolan is. Yeah. Um, maybe your super casual viewer doesn't care as much, but uh, I would say across the world, people probably know who this guy is. That, so I'm, I, I disagree with you. I don't think you disagree with me as much as you think. You know what? Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. I'm done with this fucking podcast. I just think, I'm just saying, I think a lot of popcorn moviegoers don't know who Chris Nolan is. I disagree. Really? I disagree, Gary. Yes. I disagree. I, we can't even get in the weeds. I disagree. This is wild. Okay, listen. What, Oppenheimer is about the following. Go ahead. It's based on the book American Prometheus. Okay? Nice. I'm in. By Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin. Uh, during World War II, Lieutenant Journal Leslie Groves Jr., appoints physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer to work on the top-secret Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer and a team of scientists spend years developing and designing the atomic bomb. Their work comes to fruition on July 6, 16, 1945, as they witness the world's first nuclear explosion, forever changing the course of history. I mean, if that just doesn't if that doesn't send a little chill down your spine, what the fuck are you it's doing? It's sick. It's sick. Okay, so, um, obviously, yeah, this movie came out... Um, 2023. 2023 what like two weeks ago now yeah three today is the fifth if i'm correct yes and it came out on the 21st yes okay um so yeah it stars um killian i believe it's killian some people say Cillian, and i think it's just because they're dum-dums yeah <laughs> stars killian murphy emily blunt um matt damon robert downey jr um alden ehrenreich um <clears throat> jason clark um Casey Affleck's in it, Kenneth Branagh, um, Florence Pugh, anyone else of, of note that I, I'm forgetting? I mean, those are the largest supporting roles, but, I mean, they have Josh Peck, who slips right in jo- there. Yeah, I mean, there's they Alex have, Wolf's in it, too. Um, Jack like, Quaid slips right in there. Yeah. Um, who else? Uh, yeah, Alex Wolf. you're right, yeah. Alex Wolf's in there. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's just uh, wall to wall, amazing, great actors in this movie. You know, what's um, really cool about this film is Chris Nolan really finds a way to, for actors who are at their peak of their career, to give them something fresh to work on. Yeah. And for the actors who are still finding new heights to their career, they're being given something really great to work on. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Um. So this is a uh, it's a Universal film. First Universal film. First uh, Universal's first film with Chris Nolan. Sick. Yeah. So Chris Nolan, uh, he he abandoned ship at Warner Brothers because he was upset about the way Tenet was released. Um, because it was released mid pandemic, and they released it um at the it was that whole period where studios were just um idiotically releasing um simultaneously movies yeah, simult- on on max yeah. uh, or on streamers you know it max in the case of a- our hbo max in the case of warner brothers releasing th- um movies on the- at the same time on streamers as they were being released in theaters um christopher nolan felt that that was um unfair if not sort of downright um diabolical i mean he was like pretty upset about it publicly uh, and so Universal Pictures said, hey, come on over here. It's sunny over here at Universal. And Christopher Nolan said, sure. And so they work together now, and uh, I, I'm sure they're, I don't know. I have to imagine they're happy about that. It does really make me wonder how much of this, the quality of this film is a result of Universal and how much is a, is the quality of Chris Nolan. And the reason I say that is not because I doubt Chris Nolan as a filmmaker. Chris Nolan... Um, as we were saying before, is a master of cinematic storytelling. But it does make you wonder, this film is operating on all cylinders. What would the last eight to ten Nolan films have been like if he produced them with Universal the entire time? It wouldn't be the exact same film. It couldn't be, because they would hire different people, potentially. You know? I think, uh, for, from my understanding, I think with a, a filmmaker as... Um Prolific. Again, as eminent, is that the right word? As Chris Nolan, I think they he has a lot of 
latitude. Yeah. To hire who he wants, to do what he wants, to make the film he wants. I think he's a lot of latitude. Even like producing way at the top. Yeah. Because I don't know if you know this, but Emma Thomas is, is one of his leading producers. She's also his wife. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, she and Chris Nolan are like a pretty like, dynamic by all duo. accounts, like a pretty uh, yeah dynamic team. Mm. And they come in with um, their plan. You know, this is the script. This is what we're doing. Uh, it's going to cost this amount of money. This is where we think we should shoot it. Blah, 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 blah. And they get um, large chunks of money from whatever studio it is to, to do that thing. Nice. Um, he's had that kind of latitude, from my understanding, since Interstellar, I believe. I wonder if his loyalty to Warner Brothers was waning before Tenet, and Tenet was like the icing on the cake. Because it does kind of blow my mind to throw away 10 years of a relate, 15 years of a relationship because of one film. You're right. There was probably, he was probably unhappy, you have to imagine, leading into that. Mm. I mean, it, when you see Tenet, Tenet could have been a way bigger film at the box office if they hadn't, if they had, they could have, realistically, they could have just sat on the film for another year, you know, waited for people to kind of get more comfortable going back to theaters. Because if you've seen Tenet, it's evergreen. Yeah. It's re hyper, I gotta hyper watch modern. It. I haven't seen it's it It's hyper modern and it's unlike any movie I've ever seen that's ever, I, I think it's unlike probably any movie that's ever been fucking made. I mean, it's like, sort of an insane offering yeah. as a film. Um, and I think if uh, Chris Nolan had, which, by the way, it's also, by the way, a huge blockbuster fucking movie. I mean, there's f crazy car chases, fight sequences, all this shit. Cool. Shit that people would want to go to the theater to see. So if Warner Brothers had sat, I think Chris Nolan's theory might have been, that, like, if Warner Brothers had sat on it for another year, just waited, you know, it could have done double what it did mm. box office-wise. I don't know. And so it's like missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, you know, so other uh, producers, key producers on here, um, Christopher Nolan is, of course, credited as a producer. Emma Thomas, as I mentioned, um, who is um, his primary producer. She's, you know, his producing partner, uh, so to speak. Charles Roven. Um, <clears throat> and um, some executive producers, Thomas Hayslip, J. David Wargo, James Woods. Uh, music by some, you know, one of Nolan's uh, huge collaborators, frequent collaborators, Lug Ludwig Garonson. Um, the score in this is amazing. Cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytema, who uh, shot Interstellar, who Nolan has worked with a bunch of times. Editing by Jennifer Lame. The editing in this movie is incredible. Casting, and the casting is also incredible. John Papsidera. Production design by Ruth DeJong, who I think should, uh, you know, who should probably win an Oscar for this. Art direction by uh, Jake. Cavallo, Samantha Englander, Anthony Di Perillo, um, set deck by Claire Kaufman, Olivia Peebles, Adam Willis, costume design by Ellen Mirojinic. I don't know how to pronounce that. The makeup department on this is huge. I can't even go through that list, but I mean, the makeup, hair makeup in this is incredible. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I went through some more of the crew there just because it's, I don't know, there's some really great work mm. done in this film. $100 million film. Right now, it's at uh, estimated 100 million. Right now, worldwide box office 439 million 193 thousand. Nice. Um, so you have to imagine it'll kind of keep, and I think you know people are gonna keep seeing it. So you know maybe it'll hit. You think it can hit a billion? Mm, no, mm. I don't think it will. Um, I could see it hitting you know 550 or 600 million. Um, we'll see though. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to add about Oppenheimer? That's kind of the stat sheet. No, that's, uh, that's we want to keep it simple. We want to roll the credits. We yeah. get the log line. Uh, the only other stats we should talk about briefly is... Oh, what were you doing? Ratings. It? Yeah, let's hit that. Rotten Tomatoes. So, Rotten uh, Tomatoes, IMDb 93%. And Letterboxd. Uh, IMDb, 8.7 out of 10. Okay. Um, I believe on, on Letterboxd, I saw that it had like a 4.3, which is high. Um... Tomato meter on 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 Rotten Tomatoes is ninety three percent. Audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is ninety one percent. Um, and let's see on Letterboxd.
Mm, 4.3 out of 5 on average on Letterboxd. So that's really high. So the people have spoken. The and people have spoken. Generally. And they like it, yeah. Yeah, they like it. Um, yeah, I mean, Gabe, so I- is Oppenheimer a cock up or a lock up for you? We should say to the people there's some confusion out there about what a cock up is. What Our a rating is. system, yes. There's some confusion, Gabe. Can you clarify it? I can. So long, long ago, when Colin and I were starting the podcast, we had to decide how are we going to rate films. Mm -hmm. And so we don't get wrapped up in 0.5 scores and 10 out of 10s. We were like, you know what? Yes or no? Did you like it? And if you want to go a little in between, is there a little in between? And that's it. And so a fun little quippy way we went about that is, you know, (laughs) thesaurus.com and all that good stuff. And I, I was just kind of under the impression that if we like a film, we'll, we'll lock it up. We'll lock it in. Yeah. So anything that we like, it's a lockup. Yeah. It's you put it in the box. You loved it. You're gonna watch it again, uh, and you're gonna tell your friends and your family, and uh, gonna call it a day. And then just a little bit of a rhymey rhyme with the lockup is a phrase we tripped over, uh, apparently of British etymology. It's British British slang. British yeah. slang, and it's called a cock up. Um, and the basic idea is that, like, you butchered it. Like, you done fucked yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, you botched it. Um, and the way I imagine it in my head is, like, a cock up. It's, it's kind of like, like, old slang for, like, belly up. So someone's, like, on their back, they're dead, <laughs> cock up. They're just, like, they're yeah. drunk and they're done and it's butchered and it's ruined and that's yeah, the end of that. But, th- but it's really about, it's really the butchering part. I think for some people think it had to do with cocks. It has nothing to do with cocks. I don't know. You know? Maybe. Anyway, maybe you're not. sort of suggesting maybe it does. Uh, I just don't understand how you get cock from butcher. Huh. <laughs> I don't know. But I can imagine... You a butcher a cock, you butcher <laughs> a chicken? Maybe, maybe. Maybe. That's a pretty good call. All that right. might be the, the, the origin of the British slang. Yeah, I don't know. I just know that the Brits are a little bit more casual with some of their explicit nature of their slang. Um, at least compared to how some Americans feel about their slang. Um, American slang. So, I don't know. I just thought it was like, cock up. Yeah, it could just be like some weird offhanded butcher about a chicken thingy ding. But hmm. I, my imagination is the film's on its back and it's just dead. It stinks. There you go. We do have an in-between. What do we call it? A clock up. A clock up is, you liked it enough that maybe you should go out and see it, but we're not going to see it again. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so cock up means it's stunk. Clock up means it's something in between. And a lock up means you loved it. So, Gabe, with all that being said. Lock up. With that out of the way, it's a lock up for you. <laughs> it's a lock up. Yeah, it's a lock up for me, too. I saw, I've seen it three times. You have? Yeah. I've seen it twice. the third time last night. I might see it again in 70 millimeter. So, first one was an IMAX, not 70. Second time was in Dolby, um, which... I don't know if people think is just like some other random great way to watch films. Definitely try films in Dolby. They the sound is yeah, impeccable cool. and they are doing something special with their projector system. Technically the size of the projection screens between IMAX and Dolby is different. Um but you're going to have a good time in either film format. Mm, absolutely. Um yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, you and I have seen this thing. I've now seen it in three different uh, formats. Um, was it was it better with the Alamo Draft House beer that you acquired? Yeah, the beer made it nice. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. Do you remember what beer you got? What did I get? I got um, a couple IPAs. Cool. Couple IPAs. I think I got like a hazy little thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's something nice. Every once in a while, I treat myself to Alamo Draft House. Yeah, there's nothing. A cold beer while you're watching a movie. It's nice. It hits hard. It's nice. And, um, yeah, this thing's – it's a lockup for me, Gabe. So what – you know, let's go through, like, what about the directing of this makes it uh, a lockup for you? Um, or do you want me to take a stab at that first? Why don't you take a stab at it first? What, what I will say is I think because I have less experience with directing, I, I tend to kind of view directing as a uh, – a holistic approach to the film yeah. that's driven by the writing, which is a little bit of a mistake when it's with a film that the director and the writer is not the same. 
In the case of this film, it is. And so that's why I feel more comfortable talking about that. But I'd like to hear your take first. Yeah, I mean, I think this is um, some of Chris Nolan's best directing. Um, I, 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 especially after, after seeing it, you know, a couple more times, you know. I, um, I think it's some of his best directing. It is extremely precise. Um, the composition in, in every frame there are there's a there's real drama happening um it's it's really impressive high level directing um there are some you know wide shots that are like you know where uh you know let's say you know there's a wide shot i'm thinking of in the uh you know at the white house where um straws uh is sitting across from oppenheimer and accusing oppenheimer of of allowing spies to infiltrate the los alamos uh test site in uh, New Mexico and sort of lurking in the background. I realized upon a couple more watches lurking in the background are kind of all these other fringe characters who have some sort of influence, um, in, uh, the events that unfold over the course of the film, either they betray Oppenheimer or straws sort of enlist them to betray Oppenheimer or they book their allies to Oppenheimer. And like the placement of them in the frame is like, you know, dictates like kind of what role they're playing. Um, which is just like really high level composition, um, is like, placing actors in the frame, um, you know, in ways that sort of help tell the story. Yeah. Um, I think it has a, um, edit the editing and we can get into the editing. Um, the edit here is editing in this is, is so slick and so smooth. I mean, there's basically no. I think I noticed last night, like maybe <clears throat> one moment that felt a little clunky and that's like basically it, which is just, it's really rare in films to see editing. That's this smooth and this seamless. Um, the way <clears throat> Chris Nolan is, is, is jumping, you know, in and out of moments and scenes and, and, um, stringing this story together, scene to scene is, is in, I, I, I uh, I mentioned the editor. Uh, I forget her name now, um, but uh, she did an excellent job. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's basically I think it's such a cohesive vision. You know, yeah. I think it's editing, mm. score, um, visual storytelling. You know, composition um, down to the the color, um, the 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 makeup um and again all these things sort of overlap with other later categories everything is is operating seamlessly in unison mm. i mean it, it's it's um have... really imp like almost it's pretty impeccable stuff i would say it's like almost an impeccably executed vision and i think that's what makes it a lock up for me um is it's clear to me there's one cohesive story being told about you could argue two men. I would say about one man. Um, and it's just, it's executed at, across all departments. Everything is executed in service of the story of that one cohesive story. But then layered in are all these textures and feelings and emotions and, and like, Easter eggs is not quite the right word, but all these pieces of information that upon further, uh, you know, secondary or, you know, um, uh, tertiary, you know, uh, watch, you know, viewings of it, you sort of uh, different pieces of the puzzle come into relief. And that's just like really masterful shit. So that's that's why it's a lock up for me. What do you think? I, I had three favorite moments, not three favorite moments. I have three techniques that he employed. If or more like tools is probably a tools. better word, um, during his uh, directing. One was um, his choice to have, um, you said a moment ago, you could argue the film is um, about two people. Now, the film is called Oppenheimer. The script is written from Oppenheimer's perspective. A um, lot of it is, yeah. However, uh, it is very much about, you know, two titans um, locked into history. You know, there's Strauss and there's Oppenheimer. Yeah. And so I love that he chose to do um, everything that is in color from Oppenheimer's standpoint 
and then everything that was in Strauss is in black and white. Is in black and white. Yeah. Um, it makes me wonder if there's just a subtle suggestion of like Oppenheimer, as complex as a figure as he is. Nolan's almost suggesting that like there's a more radiant and beautiful life to the way he sees the world in spite of the uh, yes. what you could say the controversial act he did of helping construct yes. the atomic bomb um, whereas Strauss really does see a lot of things in black and white yeah he in, does in polar Strauss ta- he takes you know. things very personally yes um, he is he's reactionary he's well. reactionary um, he's manipulative mm-hmm. um, and he also Strauss really there's a contrast between Strauss and Oppenheimer visually in this movie. Strauss um, bends reality to his will. So, like, I realized this on a third watch that, like, Strauss kind of makes some stuff up. So, at the end, he, he makes up sort of – he tells himself this story about um, Oppenheimer and the way he was disgraced and the way all his friends are now – like, there's this whole sequence where he's like, well, you know, his brother now works on the railroad, you know, and – and uh, Chevalier is is uh, in exile, and you know, and sort of listing all these allies of Oppenheimer and how they were disgraced, and you know, they had their comeuppance. And I realized I don't think those things are true. I think Chris Nolan is suggesting those things are in Strauss's head. Yeah, this is what Strauss has told himself about you know all the bad things that have happened to Oppenheimer because he hates Oppenheimer. Right. He hates him, and I think Chris Nolan does a great job setting up that sort of resentment sort mm-hmm. of like um latent resentment at the beginning and then it sort of comes to it rears its head by the end like you see where how Strauss really really feels yeah and Strauss he bends reality and Oppenheimer in a lot of ways sees a reality he sees reality for what it is mm-hmm. that we're really just a bunch of atoms sort of stuck together and the world is sort of this pulsing vibrating um uh, you, it's it, the universe is just a uh, an assemblage of atoms that are just kind of in motion. Yeah. So all that to say, I, I forget exactly how that was linked to your point, but uh, another technique that I was a big fan of um, was I I am huge. I love a uh, like a like a visual metaphor, um, yeah. and although this isn't quite a visual metaphor, there's the something about. Thing? Uh-uh. Um, well, I think we should get into that in the writing. Yeah. Um, but the anthropomorphizing of... Is that even the way to put it? It's 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 more just like... Long story short, um, when Oppenheimer's wife, played by Emily Blunt, brilliantly, yeah, um, is in the private Kitty. hearing... Kitty is her name. There we go, thank you. When Kitty is witnessing the private hearing and discovering... The infidelity of Oppenheimer. Well, she already knew about it. I think she suspected it, but particularly on that night when he went away, and th- it was just like it was so clear that yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. But I I think if anything, to your credit, maybe she knew about it, but the undressing, the the personal exposure, yeah, and the fact that the wife is right next to the husband, being ex like just. And I love that uh, he's then revealed as being naked, and then the choice to yes, and then they're have having sex right in the in the, in the hearing room, in the hearing. That's what I'm getting. Like, like that is such a directorial. That didn't actually, happen, no, but, but it's a directorial decision. Yes, and yes. it made it feel so painful. And you know what else I noticed? I realized and this raw. Yeah, it, the movie is so from Oppenheimer's perspective that we see we see Kitty the way he sees Kitty, which is not as. Um, an object of like sexual desire per se. Mm-hmm. She's really, she is like, she is his partner. She is his, um, she is his rock. Um, she also really believes in him and he feels that she believes, but then like he sees, um, Florence Pugh's character. I need to know the name of this character, but, um, Florence Pugh's character, uh, <laughs> Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's got to be further up than that. Yeah, where is she? Where are you, Florence? 
You could hit Command F and then type. There she F. is, oh. Jean Tatlock. Jean, that's her Jean. name. So, Oppenheimer and Jean had a very sexual, lustful relationship, and so you never see Kitty like you never see him and Kitty having sex, or you don't really see them like super affectionate or intimate. But every time he's with Jean, it's I mean, in in multiple scenes they're just fully naked. I mean, there's that scene where they're in the hotel room and like they're just sitting in chairs like both fully naked. Yeah. Because that's that was his experience with gene it was very like physical and passionate passionate and that's not how that's not who kitty necessarily was to him mm -hmm. um and i think all that stuff is sort of it's just it's all that stuff is so is baked into the script but it's told so well visually in the directing and um yeah anything else you want to add yeah the, the the one final directing thing i want to add I'm a huge fan of Nolan's choice of sound, um, and this could come into design, but this particular thing I really think is a directing choice. Um, there's a moment in the film when Oppenheimer, um, the following 24 hours after um, successfully releasing the atomic bomb at uh, in, New, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, um, he stands before his collaborators, um, and he basically gives a speech about the success. Um, and thanking all of all of them yeah and there's moments where everybody in the audience is cheering and uh like squealing screaming with delight stamping on the floor very excited about the success of this three-year-long project and yet nolan found a way to simultaneously visually show like start that sequence with all of those like positive gleeful um like you could close your eyes and feel like you're in a in a room filled with happy, joyous people, and then at one moment, like it kind of pushes in on the audience and pushes in on Oppenheimer, and suddenly those sounds of joy start turning into like sounds of agony, agony, wailing. Yes, um, and it's indicative of like w one singular event can mean something so different to. Um, depending on what's what side of the adventure you're on you know these people have been racing to like successfully pull off this very expensive and uh urgent mission which is supposed to help end the war but they started making the bomb to stop the nazis and the nazis were already out of the war when they dropped it and so the day after they so i guess it's not the day after they successfully pulled it off in los alamos it's the day after they successfully released it on uh hiroshima and it was very disturbing, but it felt truthful the way Nolan depicted that moment that Oppenheimer, again, in color, in the full complexity of life and the way he sees everything, was really having a hard time taking the joy of his collaborators when he can hear in his head the, like, families just... In Sc Japan, yeah, yeah, screaming in agony and yeah. like him being a part of that and seeing well, their he knows firsthand how destructive like what they made is right. I don't think a lot of people realize that. You I know? mean, it's it's interesting, right? It's like he was definitely in tune with it, and I also think Nolan does a pretty good job telling, like, showing that the physicists, pretty broadly, who worked on these on you know um, on this project uh, at Los Alamos and you know the uh, the Manhattan Project. In which, by the way, they were stationed literally in Manhattan, right? I think they were like under a, a football field in uh, Manhattan. Anyway, but that's not. I, I there don't was know a, to be honest. Well, there's another. There was another station. You're saying like the East in Coast. New York. Huh. Yeah, and it was uh, it was hidden underground, but they kind of created the first ever self-sustaining uh, nuclear reaction. Wow. And then like Oppenheimer took that discovery and brought it to Los Alamos and applied it to um, their work there. Got anyway. It. Um, but yeah, the basically, bottom line is um, Chris Nolan depicted the oh, American yeah. and Japanese counterparts yes. in those deeply personal moments to Oppenheimer yes. beautifully and like and terribly, like like in the biblical terrible sense. Yes, yes, the yes. Fact very that, like, biblical. It's very oh myth my mythological. Yeah. yeah. Well, because oh. the book is, it, um, let's just, we can kind of seamlessly That's work, in, work writing. into writing, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think baked into the script is a pretty good sense of like how how conflicted the physicists were about their work because they knew firsthand how powerful it was. Mm 
Um, and at one point, they try to like unionize at Los Alamos to stop the the project. And Oppenheimer sort of squashes that. Do you remember that scene? I never it's picked raining up on that. And I didn't they're realize. trying to rally around this idea that like they should just stop working um, because it's so dangerous. The Nazis got have it. surrendered. I don't know if he, yeah, got it, got it. Got anyway, but and Oppenheimer sort of squashes that idea. Yeah, because he says, "Well, no, this is actually going to be a peaceful." invention this is going to bring peace the kind of peace that he references a um i think he references hoover uh mm -hmm. president hoover and you know this is the kind of peace that he, hoover envisioned and all this stuff um the writing in this is just it's probably chris nolan it's got to be chris nolan's best writing i mean it's 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 i think really strong source material the yeah. book is I, I i'm sorry i started listening to the book on audiobook it's cool. uh, really interesting the book is is i think f chock full of just so much information and in-depth research and all this stuff. So he has great a great foundation to work off of. And I think this is some of his best writing in terms of, to me, it feels perfectly paced. I don't know how you the felt film? about it. Yeah. The film is pretty damn well paced. It's re I mean, for three hours, I, I know it's three hours, but it doesn't feel like three hours to me. I think, I think some people who can't do three hours film, uh, I admittedly will say, I don't know if this is for you. Um, but yeah, if, if you're willing to... Um, get invested in Oppenheimer. I think the first hour will go by very fast. The second hour will go by moderately quickly, and then the yeah, final the stretch of the film, crazy. in my opinion, you will be so invested at that point that you'll have to see what happens. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if you buy into it, it, it takes you on a seriously insane journey. I also, my understanding is that the script was about 180 pages. So like Chris Nolan, like to a T, got it to 180 minutes. Oh, um, it's not like he cut tons and tons and tons of stuff. He probably did cut stuff, though. But my guess is that, like, he had to get it down to 180 minutes. It can't be longer. Because my understanding is also that the film reel, at least for IMAX, was, like, so massive that they, like, basically couldn't fit all the film on, get it on the plate. Whoa. So, like, he kind of had to get it down to three hours. Yeah. And I believe the script was, like, about 180 pages wow. anyway. So it's like he, like... But I'm, I think that... He, Stuff probably ran long in the edit, and he had to, like, chop it down, if I had to guess. Because this movie, I mean, it moves so quickly, and that that's kind of a directing thing. But, I mean, what else in the writing makes this a lockup for you? Um, oh, man. Well, I mean, you just said moves so quickly. And, like, that's the thing. is like I think a lot of people, they hear three hours, and they think, like, oh, my goodness, it's a slow burn. But I, I think you're right that the amount of ground that Nolan covers. Oh, my God. Like, oh, like... Talk about a master of exposition. Like, the amount of information he teaches the he audience within the first 45 yeah. to 60 minutes with dialogue and visual yes. information. And the dialogue is so... It's so ping-pong. It's like... It's like... Bu -bu 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 -bu. People kind of finishing each other's sentences. Yeah. And so it feels really rhythmic. Uh -huh. um, but natural. It still feels natural. natural. It doesn't natural. feel like... No. Like a... Like a choice. No, it, it's 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 awesome. Um, uh, what else is in there? I mean, writing I wise, oh, oh, he he boils really complex things down to like ground mm -hmm, level, mm -hmm. so that the audience doesn't get lost in the weeds of like these like concepts of quantum mechanics that I certainly don't understand, yeah, or quantum physics or what have you. Like they don't get lost in the weeds. It's like they understand the essentials, so that the whole story that doesn't so that that stuff is just part of the story. It doesn't interrupt disrupt the flow of the story yeah i thought that was really masterful too um we spoke the other day uh about something i was a big fan of it was realizing that oppenheimer what was it it was it was about the water and the explosions and stuff like that I, yeah he he sees um part of his part of what's also baked into the script is like he sees the world as this pulsing pulsating sort of um he sees the hit what they call the hidden world right of, yeah. of physics of, mm -hmm. of quantum mechanics um and he sees when he sees raindrops hitting water for instance like he sees uh nuclear fission right it's like you know it's like it's like similar to how they're splitting atoms it's mm -hmm. like the raindrops hit the water and it forms those like uh little ripples and it's just like non these on the sort of like these sort of it, it it creates a direct parallel to how uh, uh, the the atomic bomb, um, when dropped, sort of splits atoms and then it, it sort of ripples out. Which storyline is fusion and which one is fission? So fission is 
the color storyline. Fusion is the black and white storyline. It's so interesting. And what what do you make of that? Well, I I don't know because Fission, if I'm correct, is cutting an atom, and Fusion is bombarding it with electrons. So it, it so two of them fuse to one another. Um, but Fusion would be the one with Strauss, is what you're saying. Well, no. So I, Fission is splitting, right? Yeah. And Fusion, you said Fusion is what? It's where they're putting it together they're taking two yes. and putting it together yeah, yeah, yeah but fusion is black and white you said my yeah my interpretation of that last night i was thinking about that my interpretation of that was that um fission is like the fra it's like almost like a fragmentation right if you want to think of it like from a thematic story perspective and the the color storyline that's mainly from oppenheimer's perspective is very fragmented um and chaotic and uh -huh. all these things and the fusion storyline with that's really from Strauss's perspective yeah. is like a it's like a it's a colliding of um it's a fusing of perspectives yeah um if that makes sense maybe it's like an attempt to control things too yeah yeah whereas yeah. like you know fission is like yeah you're you know controlling this on or whatever but like the idea that like you have to embrace the chaos and whatever happens um, by allowing the uh, by allowing the the cut like that violent action of cutting it. Yeah, cutting it. I know I sound so reductive because like I don't think you're literally. No, I know we don't know enough right. about physics to um, make this sound extremely smart, but yeah. we're trying. Those of you out there, um, cut, 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 <laughs> leave, leave. <laughs> um, but no, it's yeah. like what else was great about the writing? Um, I think character. I think the characters are developed really well, and I think you. There's so many characters to keep track of, and I don't think you lose track of any important ones. Um, I, I at least, especially yeah. on the second watch, I wasn't confused about who's who. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't confused about um, what those people mean to Oppenheimer, what they mean to Straws, um, who those people kind of are. I think Chris Nolan gets a develops a characters in a really in-depth way, and I think that's also related to acting, but he develops characters in a really in-depth way with short, even with short moments and scenes. Mm. Um, that was my experience of the film, you know? Um, I think I've that's great writing, you know? I mean, oh my goodness, the structuring and the plotting is fantastic. Everything is just so well connected in that film. Things that, like, you forgot about from, like, two hours ago suddenly have so much meaning. Yeah. I will also say, scene-wise, there are no, like, long scenes in this movie. Mm -hmm. A lot of scenes are really concise. Some of them are, like, literally, you know, I have to imagine they were, like, an eighth of a page. Um, but they're still significant. Yeah. Um, and if a scene runs long, it's usually you kind of s you sense it. Um, like on screen, you're like, oh, this scene is playing long and it has the effect of f focusing you even more on like what's going to happen. Yeah. And like, for instance, like when they, I think the scene that runs, one of the scenes that runs a little longer is when, um, the straws is sort they, they reveal, those guys reveal, I forget who those guys are, but Alden Ehrenreich and, uh, the other, the other guy, they sort of realize that straws deliberately sabotaged Oppenheimer and so Strauss is like kind of uncovered and Strauss kind of becomes very like wrathful and he's just like fuck you know he's just kind of pissed and that scene runs a little long but it's for dramatic effect yeah it's because you see like Strauss is keeping it together for so much of that storyline and then he just like kind of melts down um, we also kind of earn it because those are the final moments of the yeah, film yeah you know and also this other scene that runs a little long no that's that's probably the one I can think of I think the president scene runs yeah, longer the Gary than Oldman. those scenes. Yes, the yeah. Truman scene, which is one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about that scene real quick? Because you and I have talked about it a couple of times. Oh, my goodness. Like, I, I think it was just such a great... W Nolan did not have to include that scene. No. In order to um, tell the story. Um, but I think it, it more beautifully colors... Um, the character of Oppenheimer and his post-atomic uh, outlooks. And the fact that Gary Oldman comes in 
This is the only time we, we see him. We can segue into acting room. after this, too. Yeah, Gary Oldman comes in. It's the only time that he just slides in. Gary does Oldman his thing. just comes in, hits a home run, and leaves. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I love that Chris Nolan's like, yo, Gary, you want to do a little fun for one day? And Gary's like, I guess. It's almost <laughs> hard to tell. Like, you're almost like, is that Gary Oldman? Yeah. That's also, speaking of the makeup, we got to get to makeup before we wrap this up. Okay, but okay. Gary Oldman comes in, hits a home run, and just dips. That's also one of Literally. my favorite scenes, writing wise. It's so well written. Oppenheimer comes in kind of with his with his head in his hands, sort of feeling very remorseful and feeling reluctant to tell the president of the United States that they should keep developing uh, atomic weapons at at Los Alamos because they're asking him like, what should we do with it? And he says, you know, and he's not being flippant. He says like, give it back to the Indians. And I think he's being earnest in saying that. Um, and they're just not Truman. And his secretary of state are not interested in that at all. That option at all. Yeah. And Oppenheimer sort of expresses remorse at, at kind of the damage that's been done to Japan. And um, and Truman is very dismissive of that. Um, and he says, you know, no one gives a shit who created the bomb. They give a shit who dropped it. I dropped it. So don't worry about it. Which is kind and, of very interesting because it, it's it's such a great way that Nolan, in like a matter of lines, showed that Truman really is a, a politician. It's politician. all about reputation. It's all about how things politician. look. And Oppenheimer's like operating on a philosophical level. Philosophical and scientific. Yes. Yeah. And Truman's just like, don't worry about like, what people think shit? about you. What does he say? You think they give a shit in... in Hiroshima or Nagasaki about Nagasaki. who dropped the bomb? Right, exactly. Or who created the bomb? They care about who dropped it. I did. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of dismisses Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer leaves. My favorite moment in the one of my favorite moments in the film is as Oppenheimer is leaving, Truman says, "Don't let that crybaby back in here." And I love that moment because we know that um, Nolan is playing with uh, reality in this movie, like. Like there's there is a sense of subjectivity and sort of uh, uh, see, like hallucination hallucination in this yeah. in, in the Oppenheimer storyline, and you have to it makes you wonder like did Truman really say that, or is Oppenheimer imagining that Truman said that, and like because it, it seems so absurd for the president of the United States to be having this very important meeting, and as the guy's leaving. He says, don't let that cry baby back in here. And you just don't know. It's not clear. Is that, is that, is that real? I mean, what did I... Did he really say that? Did he not? Is Oppenheimer just feeling so... Self-conscious. So self-conscious that he thinks that's what Truman said mm-hmm. or, you know. Yeah. It's wild. It's one but of again, I, I, I really do feel the writing is so tight and Nolan is always so well researched when he writes these scripts. I wouldn't well, because that's because that's also because the book is, I think, is extremely well researched. I thing. wouldn't doubt if Nolan did a little bit of research on who Truman is, and Truman, in other contexts, have has said on record equally ridiculous comments. Ah, and so I wonder if he's taking a little bit of artistic liberty and yeah. inserting. It that. feels like the artistic liberty is being taken, but it's still a great moment. Yeah. Um, and do we want to segue into acting? I mean, uh, the fact that Gary Oldman pops up, hits a home run, and, and dips is sort of indicative to me, at least, of uh, there are so many great actors wall to wall, like I said earlier in this movie. I mean, just doing some really great work. We and just need to say, like, right off the bat, Killian Murphy is incredible. He's incredible. I kind of hope he wins an Oscar for this. Um, I think, unless someone comes, unless like a dark horse. You know, performance comes out of the woodwork uh, between now and you know. The yeah, end there of the hasn't year. been much this year, has there? I could see like I could see Leonardo DiCaprio in uh, Killers of the Flower Moon competing. But Leo for already it. won. I and I really want Killian to win. Yeah. Now, I think people will be pulling for him in the Academy. Um, it's because also incredible because Killian's his commitment young. to this role and his sensitivity and in, in handling the character is is. It's it's really it's really unparalleled. I'm glad it's you said really great. sensitivity to handling the character because you watch the film and you feel like you're watching an actor who's a surgeon. I you know, feel like I'm watching Robert J. Robert Oppenheimer. Yeah, 
live his life. It's mm-hmm. sort of the weight of it is sort of devastating. Um, I don't even feel like I forget that I'm watching Killian Murphy. I have to sort of remind myself. I, I'm I'm just saying from like an acting standpoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right. The, you, you watch it differently. Than yeah, the, the nuance um, and his, his ability to like make such like his craft. It's it's just clear that like this man has worked on television for years. He's been in lots of movies. This guy is operating on all cylinders. He works. You can tell how hard he works. Yeah. Too. Like it's a good remi- it's like just a great reminder that um acting is a craft. Like yeah. there is a union, there are journeyman actors, there are people who like want to be famous and blah blah blah, but Killian shows up and Killian has technique and yes. he has intent. Yes. Uh, he has integrity. Yes. And this man, like, came in, and man, I oh, it would be so great to just be in the room and listen to conversations or overhear phone calls between Nolan and Killian leading up to production. Like that I mean, would be yeah, sick. What I would give. Bah. It's it's really it's an incredible performance. Um, Killian Murphy blows it out of the water. And then Robert Downey Jr. It's 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 kind of chilling how good it is mm-hmm. robert downey jr secondarily is incredible i mean this is the best movie i've ever seen this is his best performance that i've ever seen i don't know like i'm not as much of a robert downey buff mm-hmm. but uh, th- of stuff that i've seen him in like this is just the best you know what i would he like to see kills it if rdj call me crazy because i don't know what it, his intent is for the remainder of his career i think he's in his 50s or 60s now yeah he's he's getting up there but Sorry, sorry. Like Robert. it would be nice to see. Like this is the transition we've been waiting for. Like he played Iron Man for ten years. He did a little bit of Sherlock Holmes. He yeah. did a little bit of. He even did like that goofy little Doolittle yeah. film. I love but that Robert Downey did this project. Like this. Yes. This is the film. You know what's that shows that he's transitioning to the next stage of his career. You know what's cool too is Robert Downey is someone who can help get stuff made that wouldn't otherwise get made. Yeah. And if he's willing to attach himself to projects that maybe like are like you know studios or or you know on the fence about or find whatever right i think he he's one of these people who can kind of swing the pendulum and i think the fact that he you know did this yeah you know was cast in this role and killed it i mean i think is really meaningful yeah every um, actor in this film you really feel like showed up yeah, even even the There's people no who weak links. are you There's know no, no, weak, no weak links, links. the pe- even the smaller character you know um a- you know actors uh Alex Wolf um Dane DeHaan yeah um Josh Peck Josh Peck and uh, like I said da- Jack Quaid he's got a nice little yeah. role in there um, I think it is a testament to casting yeah I think they cast it very well Emily Blunt is incredible she is she, she's a beast um. That's another instance where I feel like I'm watching a, I feel like I'm watching a person. I don't really, I kind of forget that it's her. Florence Pugh is awesome. Florence Pugh is always awesome. Um, yeah. Who else? Matt Damon. I really like Matt Damon in this I movie. I honestly wasn't in love with Matt Damon, you know what? That was. I, I stand by Matt Damon in this, in this yeah. thing. I, I really, I, I love, I, t- I believed it. I fully believed it. Like his, him as uh, General Groves, I just think. Um, he was awesome. Casey Affleck pops up. He does. Casey Affleck is scary in this movie. He's a he plays kind of a scary guy. Yeah, cold. And I was watching. I was paying more attention to his performance last night, and he made some really interesting choices. Like one, like so, some of them are just physical. So like he chose. I realized like he chose to not open his mouth too wide. It was very like tight lipped. Yeah. He kind of keeps it like real tight. Mm. And it makes his character like scarier somehow. It's like this very tense. He's just very. He's. A, it sort of adds the like the sense that he's this very very tense, very serious, very sort of grim guy. And I was just like, it's such a small choice to make, but it's such a big has such you big. You know consequence. what I bet part of it is. Yeah. I think one. Uh, we know Oppenheimer to be a bit more of a flamboyant character. Yes. In terms of like the way he carries himself physically, yeah. etc. cetera. But I also think Casey Affleck manages, if I remember correctly, tell me if I'm wrong because you watched it last night. Casey Affleck manages to play a military character that is smiling. And he is like having a human conversation trying to just like appear to have your best interests at heart. And he's just a motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. there's something about, right, those little subtleties, that, that contrast yes. that he's creating where like he can smile out of the corner of his mouth. 
but deep down, he's like he's got the blade behind his back, ready to get you. Well, also the thing I didn't realize is like anyway, but it turns out they were the the conversation that he had in that office with uh, General Pash is, is or Colonel Pash is Casey Affleck's character's name. Okay. Colonel Pash, they uh, recorded that meeting that they he did. had with Oppenheimer. Yes. yes, which is messed up. Yeah, it is. And we don't find out about that till later in the yeah. film. Yeah. Um, anyway, anything else you want to say about acting? Um, I'm actually happy if we skip down to uh, our final point, unless you want to talk briefly about makeup. Or um, I just think uh, hair and makeup in this movie is, um, the, and I saw you know there's there's like it looks like 20 people credited in that department. I mean, it is the best hair and makeup I've seen in any movie ever. It's so... Because there's a lot of aging that has to happen. Yes. For every, for every character. Yeah. Because um, this movie takes place over so much time. Um, and the aging, uh, in terms of makeup on, on the face and on the body and uh, on the hair of every actor, is so impeccable and so subtle and nuanced and um, detailed that it's just... This has to win an Oscar for uh, hair and makeup. makeup. Hair and makeup. It, it has to. I mean, it, it's 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 so fucking good. So shout out to the hair and makeup people yeah. on this movie because they clearly worked their ass. You guys off. crushed it. They crushed it. Crushed it. Um, yeah. I mean, Gabe, did this thing make you feel inspired? It did. Yeah. It, it was one of those movies that while I'm witnessing it, and while I'm walking out, and the days following, I can't help but think like. As an artist, it, one, it inspires me to continue to make my art, not simply as an exercise of ego, but as an exercise of self-discovery. Um, but two, boy, does it just get me excited about filmmaking. Yeah. To see something that is possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, like we're witnessing history. Yes. Exactly. You know? And yeah. the fact that Nolan is gifting that to us yeah. for the price of 25 bucks. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's sick. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think this thing, yeah, it, it's, Chris Nolan sets such a high bar for filmmakers in the, with this movie, and I, I, I find that incredibly inspiring. Yeah. And it, um, yeah, it just, it just, and also, reviving and bringing to life an important period in history an important kind of piece of American history, a piece of world history, and also um, a story that um, of a man, arguably multiple men, that that um, is probably easily forgotten. Mm. And the fact that he br is bringing that to life, I think, is also a real gift. Um, so I find it inspiring in that way Hell too, because yeah. um, it's it's such a it it Oppenheimer really did shape you know, the lives we live in this country for sure. And, you know, across the world, like he really did shape, uh, this country in a huge way. So he stole the sun from the gods. Yeah. You know? So, um, that's kind of my, that's my take. And, um, unless there's anything else you want to add, I think we're, uh, I think that's it. I think, I think we're, we're at good. time. All right, man. Oppenheimer, go see it. It's, it's a lockup. Uh, it's excellent. It's a lockup. It's a, it's an easy lockup. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks Chris Nolan. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, brother. This is the Movie Addicts Podcast. I'm Gabe. I'm Dale. And we'll see you next week. See you later.